I'm sure just like many of you, I woke up this morning to the devastating news coming out of Las Vegas. Another mass shooting. This time, somehow even deadlier than all the other mass shootings. And they say that this was the worst in American history, but every shooting is the worst for someone. And you know what, what blew my mind this morning is when I realized that I've, I've just, like, I've lived in the U.S., in New York, for two years now, right? And in that time, there have been 20 mass shootings. 20 mass shootings in the U.S. What's been particularly heartbreaking is other than the lives lost, is how I feel like people are becoming more accustomed to this type of news every single time. I almost know how it's going to play out. We're shocked, we're sad, thoughts and prayers, and then almost on cue, people are gonna come out saying, whatever you do when speaking about the shootings, don't talk about guns. Talking about gun control and whether we knew, need more restrictive laws, I just don't think that that's an appropriate time for this to be happening. There's a time and place for a political debate, uh, but now is the time to unite as a country. This is not the time to be talking about guns. Sometimes I wish I had used this logic as a kid when I've done something wrong, you know? My mom wanted to ground me. I should have just said, is this the time, mom, that we <laughs> politicize what's happening right now? This is not the time to talk about my lack of discipline. This is the time <laughs> for us to unite as a family to focus on the fact that I'm stuck in the kitchen window trying to sneak back in. Come on, mom. <laughs> this is not the time. When, like, when is the time? And also, if you say after a mass shooting is never the time, then you'll never have the conversation in America because there's a mass shooting almost every single day. So when is the time? Think about it with everything else. When a plane crashes, we talk about plane safety immediately. When a bridge collapses, we talk about infrastructure immediately. When a lion attacks people, we talk about why there are so many lions roaming around. <laughs> is that just me, Africa? All right, cool. <laughs> skip, skip that one, skip that one. But like, I, like I, I don't know how to... We seem to do everything to avoid talking about guns. I've never been to a country where people are as afraid to speak about guns. Every time there's a shooting, you gotta look at something else. Is it Muslims? Is it their religion? Is that what it is? Is it blacks? It's the blacks. It's the black on black crime. Is it mentally ill people? Is it white nationalists? Every time, it's a different question. And now, and now after this incident in Las Vegas, we're asking a new question. Is it hotels? Certainly hotel security will be revisited across the globe uh, after this event. There's no check of your bags. Uh, I'm not sure how one gets that many firearms up into their room, but that's going to be now an issue. Who would have thought that someone would be firing from the Mandalay Bay Hotel? So now we have to rethink security. So, so just to keep track of the arguments, mass shooting, mass shooting, mass shooting, mass shooting, mass shooting, mass shooting. We have to take care of this hotel check-in issue. Oh, and, and, uh, and by the way, just to give you an idea of how far away America is from actual gun control, this week, Congress is going to vote on deregulating gun silences. Yeah, because I guess Congress is thinking gun violence is out of control. How can we make it quieter? Yeah, how can we do that? <laughs> so, to the people of Las Vegas, I can't give you thoughts and prayers. I can only say that I'm sorry. Sorry that we live in a world where there are people who will put a gun before your lives. And the story will develop over time and we'll keep on it. But for now, let's go into the news of the weekend. Let's start with Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, a man whose name sounds less uh, like a man and more like a rich old lady's Pomeranian. <laughs> earlier this week... <laughs> earlier this week... The Secretary of State revealed that he has a direct line of communication with North Korea, which is a big deal, considering North Korea is threatening to launch nuclear weapons at the U.S. Unfortunately for the rest of us, President Trump has a direct line of communication with Twitter. U.S. President Donald Trump appears to be undermining his top diplomat on North Korea. I told Rex Tillerson he's wasting his time trying to negotiate with little Rocket Man. Save your energy, Rex. We'll do what has to be done. Save your energy, Rex? Poor Rex Tillerson. He's trying to negotiate a way out of nuclear war, and his boss is calling him out on social media for it. <laughs> like, I wonder if Tillerson's ever like, sir, do you know that your phone can make calls? Do you know that? <laughs> like, why would you tweet me? 
So I was like, because Rex, I don't follow you, so I can't DM, okay? And now, I get, I get what Trump is trying to do, though. He's thinking that by acting crazy, he'll strengthen Rex's hand with the negotiations. You know, it's the old good cop, bad president routine. I understand it. <laughs> the problem is, he's actually a bad president. It's not just a routine. Being nice to Rocket Man hasn't worked in 25 years. Why would it work now? Clinton failed, Bush failed, and Obama failed. I won't fail. You know, I would be a lot more confident that Trump wouldn't fail if he knew that North Korea has had three leaders in the last 25 years. <laughs> yeah. Clinton and Bush were dealing with different Kims. Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and now Kim Jong-un. But I guess to Trump, all rocket men look the same. <laughs> uh, or maybe, maybe he just can't tell Kims apart. Maybe that's his thing. He's gonna be uh, walking in the street, bumping into little Kim and looking at her like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> And, and Trump's, Trump's crazy wasn't just directed at uh, the Korea of the North. Remember how last week everyone was like, hey, Mr. President, stop tweeting about the NFL and focus on Puerto Rico? Remember that? Well, uh, be careful what you wish for. The mayor of San Juan slamming President Trump's response to the disaster there. So I am done being polite. I am done being politically correct. I am mad as hell. We are dying. And you are killing us with the inefficiency. President Trump responded with such poor leadership ability by the mayor of San Juan and others in Puerto Rico who are not able to get their workers to help. They want everything to be done for them when it should be a community effort. Wow, really? The hurricane-ravaged people of Puerto Rico are lazy? This coming from a man who spent 71 days of his presidency at a golf course, really? A sport where you're so lazy you need an assistant? <laughs> They're the lazy ones? Because, you see, the real victims of this hurricane are not who you think of as the victims of the hurricane. The real victim is Donald Trump. The mayor of San Juan, who was very complimentary only a few days ago, has now been told by the Democrats that you must be nasty to Trump. How are you a billionaire and the president of the United States and still the most insecure human being on Earth? <laughs> like, how? Like, a mayor of a hurricane-ravaged city is begging for food, and Trump reacts like she slammed him on a diss track. And just to keep track, Trump has now had beef with the mayor of a destroyed city, grieving Gold Star parents, POWs, and the Pope. Right. And the Pope deserved it. He said some <laughs> but I mean, everyone else. <laughs> everyone else. Really? And obviously, there was a big backlash to Trump's response. People were furious. Lin-Manuel Miranda even tweeted that Trump is going straight to hell on the fastest golf cart he ever took. And I don't know if you know... <laughs> I don't know if you know, <laughs> Lin-Manuel is like the nicest person you will ever meet in your life. And you can even see that he's nice, because even when sending Trump to hell, he let him take his preferred mode of transportation. <laughs> Look at that. That's a nice guy. <laughs> and clearly, Donald Trump is a Hamilton fan, because on Sunday, the president finally stepped up and did the right thing. President Trump dedicates President's Cup golf trophy to the people of Puerto Rico. On behalf of all of the people of Texas and all of the people of, if you look today and you see what's happening, how horrible it is, but we have it under really great control, Puerto Rico and the people of Florida who have really suffered over this last short period of time with the hurricanes, I want to just remember them, and we're going to dedicate this trophy to all of those people that went through so much. That's right, folks. Don't say Donald Trump hasn't done anything for Puerto Rico. The dude dedicated a whole golf trophy to them. And you know, in Trump's mind, that made sense, right? He was like, this weekend, both the golfers and Puerto Rico had to deal with water hazards. It makes sense. It makes sense. <laughs> like, I can't... I... I genuinely cannot believe that this guy dedicated a golf trophy. Like, on the list of things Puerto Ricans needed, a golf trophy <laughs> is somewhere in between a VHS copy of Spider-Man and another hurricane. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> because... Because Puerto Rico doesn't need a golf trophy. Right? They need baseball trophies. They don't play golf. <laughs> no, but seriously, though, they need help. They need our help as well. Don't be like Trump. Let's give to Puerto Ricans something that they can actually use. Click the link and help out. Give whatever you can, even if it's one dollar. 
You know, if anything, this may be the only silver lining of Trump's Twitter wars, is how much people have been getting involved. He gets people so fired up that they donate just to spite him. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking now we just need to get polar bears to tweet Trump and maybe we can solve global warming. Yeah.